Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. And welcome. My name is Noah Tolley, and I serve as provost here at Calvin University. I want to thank you for joining us in our second lecture <clears throat> of this year's Healthy Dialogue series. The Healthy Dialogue series is co-sponsored by the provost's office and the sexuality series, and it reflects Calvin's commitments to engage challenging conversations with humility, love, charity, and respect, eager to learn from and with our neighbors, colleagues, and students. It reflects our commitment to understanding before seeking to be understood, as well as to the vulnerability necessary to listen well and engage with those whose perspectives may differ from our own. While the majority of speakers in this series will roughly align with the teachings of the Christian Reformed Church in North America, the series will feature other voices as well, and we believe that engaging all of those perspectives with rigor, depth, and sophistication is essential to our work as a Christian university. Around campus and on Viva Engage, you'll find more information on future speakers, uh, which include Mark Yarhouse and Megan DeFranza. And I believe you can also find our first lecture by Darren Snyder Belusek online. Many thanks to Jody Van Wingerden. Jody, where are you now? Right here in the back. Good. <clears throat> Many thanks to Jody Van Wingerden for her collaboration. It's been a terrific partnership and her work has been essential to series development, speaker engagement, and campus engagement. And in fact, the attendance we have here today is a testimony to Jody's hard work. Um, thanks as well to our departmental co-sponsors from Religion and Gender Studies for their support of today's lecture. It's obvious that they know what extra credit for attendance means. Um, and now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Reverend Dr. Amy Peeler. Dr. Peeler is Kenneth T. Westner Professor, or Chair, rather, of Biblical Studies at Wheaton College. And Dr. Peeler holds the PhD and the MDiv from Princeton Theological Seminary. She is an ordained priest in the Episcopal Church and has been serving in Geneva, Illinois. She is the author or co-author of several books, including You Are My Son, the Family of God in the Epistle to the Hebrews, that's TNT Clark 2014, and also Hebrews, an Introduction and Study Guide, also TNT Clark 2020, and most recently, the author of Women and the Gender of God, which is what we've invited her to come speak about today. It is always an honor to introduce such an accomplished guest, but it is equally an honor to introduce a terrific colleague and friend. Thank you for being here. I had the great pleasure of serving with Dr. Peeler for years at Wheaton College. <clears throat> and the opportunity to work with her on several occasions. She's the kind of person who, the more you get to know her, the better you want to know her. And we all know that's pretty amazing. We all know that there are people who, the more you get to know them, the less you want to know them. <laughs> Uh, but Dr. Peeler is exactly the opposite of that. Um, and her contributions were always marked by curiosity, generosity, humility, and wisdom. And I trust that you'll discern those same virtues in today's lecture. That you'll see in her lecture what I've always seen in her work. She brings charity, respect, depth, rigor, and sophistication that is much needed in these conversations. And so I'm glad to have her here. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Peeler. I'm so grateful to Provost Tolley and to Jody for the warm welcome and preparation. So glad to be with you all here today. 
Let me give you a framework of how my remarks will be structured. There'll be some summary of my book, and so if you have had a chance to engage it, hopefully this will be a reminder to you. If you've not, totally fine. You get a little preview if you'd like to check it out. But in addition to that, I also would like to share some things I've learned over the last year since the book has come out, and also new material that I'm working on. I had, um, when I first proposed this manuscript, it had other chapters, and so this is actually a two-volume work. So uh, like you are student, a student, I'm still a student. I'm still learning and crafting my ideas. So it's a little vulnerable to try out new ideas. They might be really bad ones. And so I'm eager to hear feedback afterwards Q&A because I will benefit from anything you might offer. Whoops. Let's go back here. There we go. So women and the blank of God. The blank, you will see, is intentional. In a time of heightened divisiveness, certain terms can cause a reaction of confusion, fear, sometimes even violence. And this includes, of course, the term gender. Amid such intensity, Christians are called, I believe, instead to clarity, confidence, and charity. This lecture series, as I understand it, is aimed at providing resources to move all of us in the directions of those virtues. A few caveats before I begin. My work is grounded on Christian scripture, Old and New Testaments, as well as Christian theology, both historic and contemporary. One who enters into the conversation on sexuality and gender from a different vantage point may find my presentation foreign or constrained by unpalatable commitments. I respect that, and I engage in interreligious conversation in other spaces. But today, I imagine that most listeners will want to be aware of the Christian way, a Christian way, of proceeding in these conversations. If there are some here today for whom Christianity is not your faith, or if you aren't quite sure, I'm delighted to share this. The more I have listened to non-religious discussions on gender, the more convinced I have become that the Christian account of the world has something unparalleled to offer, both in honesty and empowerment. Second caveat. I'm grateful to be one part of an ongoing series. I see my contribution as a bit of a preamble. If the biblical text and millennia of faithful theological reflection upon it can provide a revelation of the ways that character and embodiment and the language thereof have played out for the triune God, then Christians can look to these guardrails to provide ample space for thoughtful, civil, and inquisitive conversation about any number of the complex gender issues for humanity. So I, I don't want to overpromise today. I seek to provide a bit of a theological background from which we can move forward. So today, I will focus on some very basic tenets of Christianity about God, Jesus, or in doctrinal terms, Trinity and Incarnation, which, by God's elective choice, involve a young woman from Nazareth named Mary. I will share how opening my eyes anew to the Christian story has shaped my research, has changed how I see the world, and this is not an overplay. It has changed how I live, and I hope to impart, in just a small way, a renewed sense of God's goodness to ground and, if you are so called, propel you into the difficult arena of learning about and speaking about gender. My hope is that these topics can aid the process of continued mutual learning as witness to the fact that even amidst a cultural storm, calm is possible by staying anchored to the God who became human. So to get started, what's in a name? If you've ever had to give a title to a piece of writing, you know how challenging that can be. How can you capture in just a few words what you've said in thousands? I always worry that when I name something, it just sounds cheesy at the beginning. When I began this project, I thought it would cover everything about family in the New Testament work that I had done in my dissertation. I thought it should cover God as father, Jesus as sons, Christians as children, maternal imagery for God and Jesus, Mary, Joseph, inheritance, education, calling each other siblings, and all the gender questions that arose therein. 
I wrote for months on that project and collected a great deal of data before I encountered an insightful editor who let me know that no one would want to read such an encyclopedia. It took another several years before that massive collection, like a huge and formless lump of clay, began to take some definable shape. As God's choice to invite Mary to accomplish salvation through her son became more central in my thought, I thought that she needed to be in the title. So for a long time, I preferred her conciliar name, the name that early Christians agreed to call her at the Council of Ephesus in 431, namely God-bearer, or in Greek, Theotokos. Now, my publisher, who's actually my editor might be here today, um, I, I really love my editor, uh, they weren't too keen on a foreign language title, and so I uh, agreed that we could go with the English translation, Mother of God. The hard part was coming up with the subtitle. Have you noticed this? Academic books have both. We went around and around and back and forth, and I asked all of my friends who happen to be some of the most wonderful theologians alive today, and one of them, Keith Johnson, who is a BART scholar there with me at Wheaton, he was the one that suggested, I can go back to the text thread, women and the gender of God. While I care deeply about all people, I admitted that my primary concern in this book was women, and that the book deeply investigated gendered language for God and the Savior's male embodiment via virginal conception. It was the publisher who decided that the subtitle would become the title, clean and simple. Mary's presence in the book would be communicated through image and not words, and I wholeheartedly agreed. I recognized that the title was a bit controversial. The gender of God, what does that mean? I hoped that the confluence of women, gender, God, and Mary would propel people to pick up the book. A quick read of the back would dispel any sense that this was an advocacy for goddess religion or an elevation of women to the detriment of men, a scathing critique against the Bible and Christianity or something of the like. I appreciate people like yourselves who have been willing to learn more about what I intended with this title. So two definitions of sex and gender. In the book, I defined these terms in this way. Sex has to do with bodies. Gender focuses on characteristics of bodies in action. If you blink, you might miss it, but it is on page six. I employed the terms male and female for bodies, masculine and feminine for characteristics of bodies. I also acknowledged in a footnote that the neat division between sex and gender had been unsettled, famously by Judith, Judith Butler, whose early work argued that even the way bodies are defined is culturally construed. I understand we have some gender studies students in the room. You know this better than I do. I did not, however, clarify how I found that unsettling beneficial, nor did I more carefully define my terms. What I did not anticipate is the degree to which the word gender, without clear definition of my meaning, would elicit what seems to me to be fear, resulting either in an immediate rejection of the conversation without any investigation or an angry attack also usually without thorough investigation. Because I had not been clear in my definitions, I think that some readers imagined I believed sex and gender were completely indefinable, and that for some, understandably, was fear-causing. So like a teacher who realizes the fault lies with her if many students miss a particular question on an exam, when several reviewers found my explanation of the term gender unclear, I had to admit that my definition was inadequate. Since then, I've been grateful to become acquainted with multiple books that have given me the language to speak with more clarity and confidence. I can now say that on one hand, I remain strongly opposed to gender stereotypes. While I have rather easily fit into the gender expectations of the communities to which I've been a part, in my marriage, 
this is a story for another time. I was engaged at 18 and married at 19. So this has been the better part of my life. In my marriage, my husband and I do not fit the stereotypes. In almost every way, we transgress the standards of conservative religious communities. I'm more of the leader. He's more in the background. He is, no one might remember, a great cook. I can barely fumble together to make guacamole. Uh, So I realized at a very young age, I knew at a deep level that gender stereotypes are simply not true for all people and can be constraining and damaging. On the other hand, through continued research, I've come to realize that by resisting understandings that would put people into boxes, I ran into another difficulty. If I did not want to define any differences in the lived reality between men and women, then I had little basis for for, uh, articulating my advocacy for women. If men and women are the same in the world, then why would it matter to have representation of women, say, in the fields of theology? Why would it matter if most theologians are men? While the concern about putting people in boxes is a real one, having no definitions at all removes a foundation for the work of gender justice. So I had to discover a middle way between these two poles. On one side, the rigidity of my past, where it was proclaimed that bodies dictate what one should and should not do in the world, where gender is carefully and exhaustively prescribed by one's sex. But on the other, it also seemed right to counter writings like early Judith Butler, where all things are constructed, So how one should be in the world as as well as how one categorizes one's body is completely personally determined. Although I didn't have a definition clearly in place, in this book, I was working out of convictions I held, but only now can begin to articulate. In what follows, I will present what I believe scripture and Christian tradition teaches with respect to God and humanity concerning sex and gender teachings that are neither rigid nor boundless, but revelations that provide guardrails, limits that cultivate a wide space for the flourishing of all. I'll begin today with Mary, and this is maybe my favorite Annunciation by Henry Osawa Tanner. If you don't know him, please do look up his work. Now, there is power in considering the way that God invites her participation in the plan of salvation and then, with her assent, works through Mary, her body, will, voice, emotions, her tangibly enacted faith. I wish right now we could pause and take a quick poll. Who among us has deep experience thinking about Mary and for whom among us is this new? I hope for both ends of that spectrum, I provide something fresh that you haven't considered before. Often, Mary is lifted up as the quintessential example of faith, and this is correct. She said yes when God invited her. Some in the tradition have called her the first Christian because she is the first one that said yes to God's invitation of Jesus, and that seems correct. Now, we could say the same, that there are others in the tradition who have said yes, Moses and Abraham and Paul, but there is something non-interchangeable about Mary's invitation. Given the way that human biology works under, I would argue, God's design and providence, and the way that God chose for salvation through incarnation to happen, then God could not have extended the same invitation to an Abraham or a Moses or a Paul. The particularities of her body matter. Sex matters. For the Savior to be born, the Savior was to be born of a woman, as Paul says in Galatians 4. In so doing, God made a bold proclamation concerning the female body. In many religions, female bodies were associated with uncleanliness, not sinfulness, but still impurity. But by drawing from her body, both in conception and gestation, and by dwelling within her body, God did not invite a woman into holy space. Mary was not allowed to go into the Holy of Holies in the temple in Jerusalem, 
But God elected her as the one where God's holiness would dwell. Now, I have wondered if there is a connection between the lack of differentiation between male and female bodies and sacred rituals in Christianity. We think of Lord's Supper, but chiefly baptism. I've wondered if there's a connection between that and the way that God chose to work out salvation. No one can attend to the Christian story and conclude that the bodies of women are religiously unclean. If they do arrive at that conclusion, they stand in disagreement with God. Because I am now more sure that bodies can never be fully separated from how those bodies are judged in culture, then we should also take advantages of the resources provided in Christian scripture to attend not only to Mary's body, but also her gendered expression as a woman. You probably are aware that in many times and places, a common trope about women and femininity is that women should be passive. The idea is that because women are typically smaller in body, women should accept what stronger male bodies direct for them. I know there are exceptions, but I'm speaking in general trajectories here. But one realizes that through an intentive investigation of the New Testament, that nothing could be farther from the truth about Mary. Mary is receptive to God, as all believers should be. But Mary is never passive. Let me seek to provide some uh, proof for that. We could go first to the the Annunciation, Uh, This is an icon that was gifted to me by my husband upon the completion of this book. It hangs in my office. I wish I could show you in person. It's quite lovely. But at the Annunciation, and if this were a class, I teach a class on Mary at Wheaton. We have 15 weeks to do this material. I've got about three minutes right now, so I'm going to try to condense, all right? But in the Annunciation, when Gabriel goes to her and proclaims, Greetings, favor one. The Lord is with you. You will bear the Messiah, the heir of David. He will sit on the throne of Israel forever. What fascinates me about Mary is that she doesn't immediately say, awesome, sweet, yay, I've always wanted to be the mother of the Messiah. Instead, she is thoughtful. She's first disturbed, and so he has to give her more information. She asks questions famously, how can this be? I do not yet know a man. And when she asks that question, he's able to say to her, yes, this is going to be different. You will be overshadowed so that your child will be called holy, son of the most high God. She displays a thoughtfulness and an inquisitiveness, not a plucky, oh, yes, please accept, but she dialogues with him. And that is a powerful testament to her character. She would have recognized the honor of bearing the Messiah, but also the cost. For if she bears the king of Israel at the time of the Roman Empire, this transgresses against the power of the empire. She knew the honor and the cost, and she willingly accepted both. This is the second and important point. Her pregnancy is not forced upon her. And if you've had a chance to read the book, you know the whole first chapter entertains this uh, question. Gabriel says this will happen, but notice that's in a future tense. It has not already happened. Gabriel does not come to her and say, guess what? You are already expecting, but this is in your future. And note that Gabriel does not leave her presence until she gives a verbal response. Let it be unto me according to your word. She willingly accepts. Her yes, her fiat, changes everything. But she knows what, uh, she doesn't know everything. She doesn't know that he will die and rise again. But she knows that this will be a weight, a weighty honor. And she accepts it. Well, as her story unfolds from there, immediately, with haste, Luke says, she goes to meet her cousin, uh, her family member, Elizabeth. I had a chance to visit Israel for the first time in May. Um, we remain in prayer for this whole area. 
and I got a chance to visit Ein Karem, which according to Christian tradition, I'm seeing many nods, maybe many of you have been there. This was Elizabeth's home where Mary would have gone and encountered her. And you have this um, strong uh, metal uh, statue, but yet the faces, which are difficult to see, convey the softness and the joy. And she meets Elizabeth, and then she burst forth into song, the Magnificat, which is so powerful. In our class, we chant the Magnificat at the beginning every day. And by the time, by the end of the semester, students have developed into polyphonic chant. And it's just amazing. And this song is so fascinating because in it, she both recognize herself. She is blessed of God. She's not that kind of wilting, oh no, nothing ever good has happened to me. She's like, owns it. She's like, God has blessed me. But she's also not prideful. She said, you want to know, I'm going to tell you more about my God. And this is a radical, revolutionary song. Some dictators in some countries have prohibited people singing or saying the Magnificat because it speaks of God's right-siding up of the kingdoms of the world, where the proud are brought low and the humble raised high. And in God's good providence, this is not just a tiny little song that's uttered in this space between two women. Luke records it in scripture, and then it weaves itself into the worship of the church. Every evening, countless Christians across the world sing Mary's song. Is this an act? Example of passivity? I think not. We could move forward again to her encounter with Jesus in the temple when he's 12. We, we, this is one of the only times that we're told something about Jesus's young life. Of course, he stays behind. You know the story. And Mary and Joseph realize, oh my goodness, he's not in the caravan. We have to go and find him. If you've ever lost a child that you're caring for, maybe a babysitting job or a family, you know that <gasps> gut reaction. Oh my goodness, I've, I've lost a child. Imagine you're Mary and Joseph. You're like, I just lost God. Like the the... the it, it's a little more costly there in that situation. So they have to go and find Jesus. And when they do, here's what I want to draw attention to. When Mary approaches him, she is honest with him. She says, you have brought us pain. She doesn't just, oh, whatever you do all the time. She is mothering him. <laughs> and fascinatingly, Luke goes on to say that after that moment, Jesus seems to hear her and realize uh, maybe it's not time to start my mission. The way that Luke closes this account is he says that Jesus then submits to his parents. He defers to them. He goes back home and only after that does he grow in wisdom and stature and favor with God and humanity. So not only has God deigned to enter the world through the body of a woman, but God the Son is educated by her. God the Son submits to her and Joseph. She is shaping the character of the incarnate one. Again, not very passive. We can move to the first miracle of Jesus, the wedding at Cana. Please go back and read this if you haven't read. I see some of you dancing. You love this, you love this account. Uh, it's a fascinating thing. They're at a wedding. Uh, uh, my new friend Emma here just said that on The uh, Chosen, this is really well done. I haven't seen that episode yet. But there's a wedding. Mary somehow knows that there is a problem of the wine running out. I grew up as a Southern Baptist, so I always read this text. I was like, why is it a problem if you don't have wine at your wedding? You shouldn't. That's a terrible thing. Uh, but in Jewish culture, this was a, a, an issue of shame. And so she goes and says, there's a problem. And Jesus, what an interesting statement, right? Woman, it is not yet my hour. What does this have to do between you and me? That's a whole conversation for another. Please don't go home and call your mother's woman. Uh, there are reasons why that makes sense in the Gospel of John. But what does Mary do? She doesn't give up, right? What she And neither does she like nag him. Please, please, will you do this right now? Please. We, no. She turns to the servants who are in this home, or kind of the, the workers at the wedding. And she says, you see that fellow over there? Go over to him and do whatever he tells you. She's both persistent and yet she leaves the ball in Jesus's court. He could say to the servants, bless you, have a good day. But by her persistence, uh, Jesus, um, Jesus does the miracle. Oh, there's so much more we can say there. But my point for today is she's not passive. She is an instigator 
at his first miracle, at his first sign. We'll keep moving. In the Gospels, there's an interesting account in which, and this is a horrible, like, uh, Sunday school artwork. You know why? Because there's not many renditions of this account. So you have to find the horrible Sunday school ones. Uh, But this is when Mary and the brothers of Jesus are kind of on the outside. They're coming to check him out. and, And somebody said, hey, your family's out there. And he said, who is my family? Those who do the will of God. And that has been read at some times. Is he kind of rejecting her? I think not at all, because in both Matthew and Luke, has she done the will of God? Absolutely, yes. She has been faithful. I think this story is beneficial for us to see that she doesn't get into Jesus' circle, the family of God, only by her body, but first and foremost by her faith that is manifest in her body. We could move then to John 19, there at the cross. We know that the disciples flee. We know there's a group of women looking on from a distance, but the only ones who are proximate are Mary and John, the son of Zebedee, the beloved disciple. This is a costly place to stand. You are near the traitor associated with him, and yet she is willing to do so, not only endure the possible persecution that should come, but I know this is very difficult for us to imagine, especially if you are, are um, not yet to the age in which you could think about children, but to watch her son suffer and die. She's willing to be close to him and, and go through that. What active faith I'll close here with my, I'm not done yet. Sorry. You're like, oh, wow. Um, Keep going. There's only part on Mary. I am so grateful that in God's providence, Mary's story is not only in the Gospels, but continues into Acts at the birth of the church. Luke mentions her in 114. She is gathered with the other disciples of Jesus who are awaiting the coming of the Spirit in the upper room. She's the only woman mentioned by name, but Luke says a group of men and women are there. And then that is right before Pentecost happens. And so in Christian art, uh, like, like this rendition, you see Mary prominent at Pentecost. One might say, well, she's mentioned when they're praying, but maybe she left the room or something and she's not there. But if you keep reading into Peter's Pentecost sermon, you will know that after the gospel has been proclaimed in these many dialects, Peter will say, you know what you all have seen here today? It's the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy that sons and daughters will prophesy. That's not an inclusive translation just in the English. That's in the Hebrew of Joel and and the Greek of Acts. And moreover, Peter goes on to say, as he's quoting Joel, what you have seen here today is the spirit falling upon male and female slaves, or sometimes translated handmaidens. Do you know the only name, the only time that Luke mentions a female slave in his whole corpus, Luke and Acts? It's her. She identifies herself as the handmaiden of the Lord, both in the Annunciation and in the Magnificat. And the next time you get that word is in Acts 2. I think there is no way that Peter's statement makes sense unless Mary was vocally proclaiming her son's gospel at Pentecost. So she is present in so many places. She is, we know her and care about her initially because God invited her to give of her body, to be the mother of God, but her story does not end there. She is faithful in all of these ways with an active faith. What a powerful example then at the heart of Christianity that God so honored the body and influence of a female who was then never constrained to live within the negative strictures of femininity that her culture placed upon her. And here's my contention. If this is true for her, it's my hunch that this also could be true for all women who have faith in her son, that we too are not constrained to live according to the strictures, the negative strictures of femininity in the cultures in which we live. Now, all that being said, If God does all this for women, as exemplified in Mary, but if God looks like this, then the door might still be opened for an imbalance toward or a privileging of the male. 
Now, Christian theology has always affirmed, but I should pause here for just a moment. I could have decided to write a nice little book about Mary. <laughs> Look at all the sex of Jesus, isn't this fun, all these passages, and stopped there. And then I never would have gotten myself into any kind of trouble. But that wasn't the call that God had put upon me, and so I needed to keep going. So if, if, uh, if Christian theology has always affirmed that God is spirit and that God is not embodied. This is Jesus' conversation with the Samar- Samaritan woman. God is spirit, is looking for those to worship in spirit and truth. Uh, Christian theology has always affirmed that God is creator and not creation. Our theologians among us know that there is an infinite qualitative divide between the creator and creation, that distinction. And though this is true and known in Christian theology, many have assumed, even unconsciously, that God is a male being, grander and more perfect than human males, but different only by scale, not kind. Given the preponderance of masculine gendered terms for God in scripture and tradition, this assumption is completely understandable. We've talked about it in several of the groups that I've met with last night and today. But I have become even more firmly convinced by exegesis that Christian theology is correct. God the Father is not a male being, a giant dude in the sky. (laughs) Counterintuitively, I have found that the Annunciation narrative affirms that truth in a most convincing way. Just at the point where we might imagine that God is male, for this is the moment at which God causes a pregnancy, an act that men do, the evangelists chiefly Luke amass statements that eliminate that false imagination. Hang with me here, because this is hard to hear, right? The affirmation of what every Christian has said throughout time, God the Father is not male. That doesn't make sense at a surface level, right? So let me walk through a few things there. And I'm going to go really quick here. If you're like, I have no idea what she's talking about, you could check out the book because then you can look at the footnotes. So first, the numbers don't add up. A human pregnancy is a triad, is it not? A father, a mother, whose union results in a child. But in the incarnation, there is one mother and one child, Jesus of Nazareth. But the place of the Father has two actors, God Most High and the Holy Spirit. Now, I recognize it will take several hundred years for the church to arrive at triunity, but the exegetical wrinkles are there in Luke. Moreover, according to Jewish belief, God was involved in every pregnancy, assuring that the womb opened and a new life came to be. God superintended the incarnation as well. But God does not replace the male. Does that make sense, right? Father, mother, child, God steps in where the man normally is. No, God is always present in the reality of a new life. God does not replace the male in the incarnation. God simply chooses not to invite a male to participate in the life of this child at its beginning. Second, and most obviously, And this is where one must spend the time, some time. Annunciation is not a sexual encounter. I know this might be difficult to hear. I grew up in such a way that I had never imagined that anyone would would think uh, this way. But there is a lot of literature throughout Christian history where people have wondered about this. And this is why. Because in the Greek and Roman world, people knew of many accounts in which gods imposed themselves upon women. Luke knew that. And Luke chose not to tell such a tale. Now, of course, those familiar with the scriptures of Israel would know that God, the God I am, would never and could never and would never act in such a way. But even the uninitiated, say you have a Gentile reader of Luke who doesn't know all of the scriptures of Israel, even the uninitiated would notice that conception does not incur here through any entering into Mary's body, but instead an overshadowing of her. This is above language in the Annunciation. In fact, it's the same term of when God's glory overshadows the tabernacle. A non-sexualized divine conception very much points toward a non-embodied God. God, the Father of Jesus, is not embodied. God, the Father of Jesus, is not male. Now, this should not be a shocking conclusion, even though the path that I've just walked to get there might not be one that you've traveled mentally before. 
I do not believe that this is so obvious of a conclusion that it's a ridiculous waste of time to state it. Not only have I encountered more people over the last year that actually believe God the Father is male than I ever thought possible. When, when I wrote this initially, I thought, nobody really thinks this. Wow, they have come out of the woodwork. Uh, people do assume this. Not only does that, is that true, but even more, there is another more common, deeply held, and unexamined assumption, and therefore a more insidious one. Even for those who do not believe that God is male, when pressed, they might admit that males are more like God, or in gendered terms, that God is masculine. The logic might work in this way. Men are often, or should be, leaders. God is the most sovereign leader. Men are often, or should be, initiators. God is the first cause of all things. Men are often, or should be, protectors. And God is the most powerful protectors. You see the connections. All of these things are true of God first and foremost. God is sovereign, initiates in creation and salvation, and protects better than anyone else can. But I have never found anything in scripture that demands we call these qualities masculine ones, that we associate them more fittingly with men. I fully recognize I'm entering here into terrain about which we might disagree. And that's a conversation for a different time about different texts, which I'm happy to have. But I have not been drawn to that conclusion. Now, these things can be true of men. I am privileged to work under a superb male leader in my dean. No one and I know having David Lauber as my dean is like a dream world. Uh, I'm grateful for important invitations and interventions in my life that have come from men. But leadership initiation and protection is not true only of men. Women can lead. Women can initiate. Women can protect. There's no justification, it seems to me, then, for, view for viewing God the Father as more like men than women. For as we know, all of us bear the image of God, a God who is not male, and therefore all of us can participate in the good, divinely exampled virtues. The ethic of the scriptures calls every human to be holy as God is holy. Hence, if God is not a creature, not a male being, and God's qualities are not more masculine than feminine, not more readily available to male bodies than female ones, then we should seek to unearth these images of God from our mind's eye and seek to understand scriptural language like father as a truth about the God who is revealed ultimately in the divine son, Jesus Christ, the one who became human through virginal conception and birth. And so then, of course, to Jesus we must turn. I'll begin with a reflection on his embodiment. In the book, I acknowledged my engagement with scholars who had entertained or championed the idea that Jesus could have been intersex by virtue of the virginal conception. I wanted to read that literature carefully. But given that there was never a question about his male body, even when he is circumcised in Luke 2, I found that hypothesis unconvincing. I opted instead to embrace the idea that his maleness came about miraculously. And it struck me, and I learned that I am not the only one to notice this, that his male body coming from the flesh of Mary alone indicated something radical about the inclusion of men and women in the bodily redemption wrought by, by Christ. Our faith is not only about our souls or our spirits, so that it is true we all have spiritual access to redemption through Jesus, no matter our sex. But I sensed that his incarnation said something more. There is a permanent and beautiful inclusion of male and female embodiment in his incarnate and now resurrected and ascended body. If we are baptized into the body of Christ, it is this one. If our high priest is interceding for us before the Father, it is in that body. His body is the template of our resurrection hope. My friend David Moffat, who writes on Hebrews, says it this way, There is Jewish flesh in heaven. What a provocative statement for us to kind of capture the reality of the ascension. I would add that Jewish flesh in heaven advocating for us came from Mary by God's miraculous work. 
He is fully a human male, but from the body of a female alone. And this has proven to be a powerful affirmation of Christian inclusion for me for several years. I could tell you some stories. We'll see if we have time afterwards. But I, I still believe this is true. And this does not seem to me either radical or unorthodox. I, I think I'm just saying what the creed says, Jesus was virginally conceived. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. He is male, who got his human flesh by God's miraculous overshadowing from a female alone. Now, I have come to accept, however, that out of my zeal for the incarnation's dignifying grace for all, I stated the point either too dogmatically or with too much rhetorical flourish, I'm guilty of that, that added with my non-definition of gender has proven another point of confusion and contention. Several readers have understood my language to imply that the only way God the Son could really include men and women in recapitulation is to have been born from a virgin. That insinuation of necessity seems to infringe upon God's freedom. In addition, it also appeared that I was claiming that Jesus was a unique human, different from all others, without also affirming clearly enough that he is a true human, like all others. I do affirm both, namely that he is fully human like us, miraculously, and that the origin of his humanity is miraculous in a way distinct from us. I could check, I guess, but I doubt any of us have been virginally conceived. I had not stated these points carefully enough, and I do not believe that is just a problem of communication, but also because the idea was not as clear and as orthodox in my thinking as it could have been. Let this be a note to you students. I spent 11 years working on this book, and now I know there's ways I could have made it better. I hope that's not depressing. It's exciting. We'll always keep learning. The mishap in my thinking was not so much with Jesus as it was with Mary. This is the new stuff I'm trying out. He is fully and truly human and became so in a completely unique way, but I had posited her as the representative of women alone. And I don't think that's quite right. She is female and his flesh comes solely from her. And yet, she is the daughter of both a mother and a father. I believe that's right. I know there's a whole vein of tradition about that. We can have a conversation later. But I think that makes good sense. Uh, Does that acknowledgement result in a loss for women? Uh, Let me do the math for you for a moment. Jesus is male. Mary is female. But yet, she brings the DNA of her mother and her father. And so to speak crudely of that genetic equation, is it the case that in my first line of thinking, women contribute half to the incarnation, and now if we recognize that she has a mother and father, women are only contributing a fourth? Uh, If there's any science students, you recognize the absurdity of that. I was going down the wrong path. I do not, however, believe that shifting my thinking on Mary results in a loss for women within the Christian faith. Quite the opposite. Hear me out on this. She was a singular human being, a a common human being. And the Logos is the son's miraculous assumption of her caught up all human beings in her singularity. Here's the key. She's not just the link to women. She is the link to all humans. God said from Mary, I will assume all humanity and then restore all of creation. Now, it wasn't necessary that God work in this way. And this is the point about God's freedom. God could have, again, as was true in Israel's past, chosen a man to represent the people, a king or a high priest. God could have chosen Joseph to be the Savior's link to humanity. Now, there's a lot there about human biology that we might talk about God's design. But let's just say in God's freedom, God could have chosen Joseph. But God didn't. Jesus as a fully human man salvifically represents us all for salvation. And the way that God chose for that to happen by election and not necessity is to begin with Adam as the representative of the human race in new creation. Um, Excuse me. Adam is representative of the human race at creation and fall. And then end with Jesus as the representative of the human race in new creation. I'm just summarizing Romans 5 here as Paul lays it out. 
But we must also acknowledge that God chose for this recapitulation to happen through Mary, right? Jesus represents all humans as human because God chose for Mary to represent, not a man, but a woman, Mary to represent and catch up all humans to make Jesus human. Could we not say then that God chose Adam and Mary to lead to Jesus? Now, not only do I think this maintains a radical inclusion of women in God's plan for salvation, but it seems to me, we might disagree, and that's okay, we can chat afterwards, it seems to me that this unsettles a concept that needs attention, namely that of headship. For if it is common to call Adam humanity's federal head, would it be wrong to call Mary the same? Is God's way to make new creation possible? Adam brings us to the realm of sin. Mary, by her yes, brings us to the realm of salvation, and Jesus and Jesus alone saves us all. As an affirmation of the first divine statement concerning humanity that both male and female, without privilege or lack, bear the image of God, so has God chosen for a man and a woman, Adam and Mary, to be the representatives for fall and redemption. It's a suggestion that I'm playing with. We'll see if it works out. How am I on time? Not good. Uh, (laughs) Well, I'll move quite quickly here because I do want to get to questions. We also might need to spend some time on Jesus' embodiment, his gender. I'll move quickly here. I'm going to go to Galatians. Paul says some interesting things there. He says to the Christians there, you're all sons of God, you're all seed of Abraham, you're all heirs of the promise. So in some ways, he's calling this whole audience, you're all free Jewish males. You might kind of imagine that you all look like Walter Solomon's Jesus. Now, of course, there comes some real questions about this. Is Christianity assimilationism, right? We all kind of lose our identities as we step into Christ do not think that is the case, because Paul uses the language here of clothing. You've been clothed with Christ in baptism. And that image necessitates that there's still a person who wears the clothes. But think about how clothes make you feel, right? You have a bathrobe on, or hopefully you don't walk out in bathrobe. Let me try something else. You have on gem clothes, and you go to the store, you're like, oh, I feel gross. Or you have like your three-piece suit. You feel differently about yourself, and people interact with you differently, right? Paul has says, you are all clothed with Jesus. That doesn't take away your identity. In fact, what an honor that is for, in the Galatian community, a free Jewish male. Wow, you now bear the honor of the Messiah. Now think with me. If there is a Gentile woman who's a slave— and she also gets to be clothed with Jesus, what an increase of honor that is for her. Uh, My point here is that Jesus navigated the world as a male. There's a way in which I will never understand that, nor will he understand what it is to navigate the world as a female. Maybe I have hit upon Jesus' gender is a scandal of particularity. He too is Jewish. I'm Gentile. There is a distance there. The question I ask about his gender, his masculinity, is does that play out in loss in the church? And my understanding of Paul is that that's not the case. If we're all clothed with the same honor of Jesus, if we should think of ourselves and treat others as we would treat the Messiah, then his lived experience of a man, while that might be a blessing and a a connection point for you gentlemen, I pray that it is, is no detriment to me in my lived reality in the church. There's more that I could say. We'll keep going. To conclude then, I've laid out some basic Christian affirmations. God is not male. I hope that doesn't shock you. Mary is Jesus's mother. And Jesus is a male born of a mother alone. So to wrap around where I first began, what guardrails might these confessions provide for ongoing conversations about sex and gender? Here's some suggestions. 
God the Father and God the Spirit are not embodied, that's easier for us to understand with the Holy Spirit because spirit, we kind of get there, right? It's Father's language that makes it more challenging. Both are not embodied and therefore no qualities deemed masculine or feminine are more prominent in the triune God. It is theologically impossible to assign a gender to God because God is not embodied. And because all humans, male and female, are made in the image of God, no one of us is more like God than another. God the, God's invitation to Mary is inseparable from her female body. God proclaims at the heart of the Christian faith that God deems the female body worthy of the holy. Female bodies are generally weaker by comparison and more vulnerable. And so if the sinful trajectory for women is to be pushed into or self-resign into passivity, then by the power of the Spirit, Mary shows that Christian trajectory for women is not to fall into this trap. Conversely, the trajectory for male bodies might be to succumb to the temptation to overpower by virtue of their greater comparative strength. But Jesus does not succumb to this, but instead uses the power afforded to him as a male to create space for others to live virtuously and abundantly. God, who is not embodied or gendered, is pleased to work through the male and female sex to overcome the temptations that come to each, passivity and dominance. Hear me. I don't mean that every female feels more tempted toward passivity or every male toward dominance, but here's what I mean, that these temptations are imposed upon their equally good and yet different bodies by a broken world. Genesis, Genesis 3 names that brokenness as the wiles of God's enemy who seeks to divide and destroy. But on the heels of his initial victory, when he tempted Eve and Adam to sin and they succumbed, when he was victorious initially, right on the heels of that comes the promise of his defeat. It's the gospel in Genesis, Genesis 3.15. There God says, it will be the seed of a woman who will crush the enemy's head. And God has invited us, I think, to implement the mutual flourishing, the unity of mutual flourishing of all that he has already achieved. May these offerings be a stimulus for you to feel more confident and clear-minded that we can enter into this field of discussion. Thank you. Do we have time for questions? We do. Excellent. Question for Dr. Peel? I can start. So this, um, this picture here, I think, I, as I understand, there's a lot of tradition about Mary kind of like overcoming Eve's temptation yes. in yes. especially in this connection here mm-hmm. with this verse you're talking about. Yes. And I wonder if you talk about that. Absolutely. And and I was grieved to cut that. <laughs> um yes. And what a beautiful comparison. There's so much symmetry going on now. That that can go south in the tradition real fast in which people just beat up on Eve all, uh, unnecessarily. And yet, uh, in a healthy appropriation of that, and I think this is actually what Paul is doing in 1 Timothy 2 when he mentions Adam and Eve and then goes to redemption through the birth of a child, there is a way in which um, as, as you have sin enter the world through Adam and Eve, then you have redemption made possible uh, by Mary's yes, who leads to Jesus. So there's a male, female, female, male symmetry there that has been recognized. Really, the first reflections in church history on Mary are a connection to Eve. There's a lot of good fruit there. I'm playing with the idea because then in some spaces, namely Roman 5, Eve falls off the map completely. And you get definitely a pretty robust theological tradition of the headship of Adam. So I think there might be multiple vehicles to kind of approach how the creation narrative gets appropriated in the New Testament and how it applies to gender. That's a few things uh, in those connections. Yes, sir. So 
So as you know, there are some Bible verses that Paul writes. Corinthians and Timothy. Mm -hmm. oh, I know exactly what they are. It's just like, well, they can't read. Like, That's can right. Can you please specify what the heck does that mean? All of us, we, me personally, so we, like, I want to not mm -hmm. think that women can be like pastors mm -hmm. and spiritual leadership, yeah. but it's kind of hard to argue for people who kind of put Absolutely. that, and I don't really have a good answer mm -hmm. for that, because yeah. please elaborate. Yeah. Uh, I thank you for that question, and everywhere I have traveled, it's the first or second question. <laughs> Uh, which I love. This is my life, and I think that's why I'm on earth to talk about this question. So thank you for it. Um, and that's and I don't mean to be cheeky. Well, let me say this. Uh, there are so many good uh, writings. I recommend two. Cynthia Westfall's Paul and Gender uh, and Lucy Pepiot's Rediscovering Scripture's Vision for Women, both of whom would say, I am completely under the authority of the scriptures. I don't take my Sharpie and mark these out. But they walk through how those texts can be read. Silence in the church for women does not make any sense because in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul says that women are praying and prophesying. You can't really prophesy with keeping your mouth shut. Uh, and so when you get in 14 that women should be silent, if you read in a coherent way, then that silence has to be to a particular kind of speech. I might say it's like interruptive speech. If you know where house churches meet, it's in an atrium, a room with 30, 40 people, kind of very echoey. If everybody's like, hey, what do you think about that? It's, it's the same admonition that Paul gives to the prophets, take turns. Uh, so I think that's the kind of silence. My friends who do not believe in women preaching would say it's standing at the pulpit and having authoritative teaching. That's what's prohibited. I have not been able to discover that in the New Testament, mm, sorry, I have not been able to, dis it doesn't seem fitting to me that New Testament churches offered like a 45-minute monologue sermon. Uh, I think that's a later development. I don't think that's first century Christianity. So that answer doesn't seem to make sense to me. Very quickly, what I think is going on in First Timothy 2. I do not put him in a moment to teach nor to have authority of a man. Uh, I mean, that just kind of sounds like that's how it should be. But then what's the reason? For Adam was created first and then Eve. Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but Eve being deceived fell into transgression. He goes to creation. And so my friends like myself who advocate for the preaching of women, I don't think we can say, well, it's just cultural because then our interlocutors on the other side would say, but he talks about creation. I think what he's saying here is this. He's like calling forth the, the Genesis narrative. Hey, Adam was first and then Eve. That's just a statement, right? You have to interpret that statement. What does that mean? It doesn't mean Adam's the leader. I mean, you can think that if you want to, but it's not like super clear. It could also be Adam was incomplete on his own and needed Eve's participation with him. Either would be a fine way to read. Paul just names it. It is the case that the serpent goes to Eve and, and she's te deceived. The clearest reading of 1 Timothy 2 is this. Women are second and they're more sinful. Nobody wants to say that. I mean, they didn't uh, like read anything in church history and people are very comfortable saying that. Nobody wants to say it today. Here's what I think Paul is doing. He frequently will rhetorically name what the audience is thinking. He, he does this in other places. Jesus does this too. Listeners in the audience uh, would very much be culturally conditioned to think that women are second in creation and first in sin, right? He's just stating, like, this is how the narrative unfolds. Interpret it as you will. They're like, yeah, those women, second creation, first in sin. And then verse 15, but she will be saved. How? Through the bearing of a child. I think Paul is doing this. I think he's saying, yeah, you think these bad things about women? Guess what? How has God entered the world through childbirth? And then he goes on to say, because you have been moved into the realm of salvation, then women have the ability to grow in the virtues of goodness and faithfulness and self-control. This explains then why Paul is very comfortable with women doing theological speech in Christian circles, namely someone like Phoebe or Junia. He hands the letter of Romans to Phoebe. She takes it and maybe she read it, maybe it's not, but if they have questions about it, guess what? She's Paul's representative. So you, I'm sorry, you can't tell, it is not persuasive to me that Paul never allowed women to have theological 
a, a theological influence in Christian spaces, or he wouldn't have handed his most theological letter to a woman. So I think that puts that into more coherence of how he's understanding that text. But I totally understand that that is a lot of work, right? And so many of us will read those passages and like, well, I guess women should be quiet. So it is on us to reason about these texts. And I respect if someone lands in a different place. These are not worth dividing over. We don't have to worship in the same church on Sunday, but we can partner together in mission in other ways. I never want to tell someone you have to change your conviction. But there is a, uh, a urban legend that people like myself just don't really care about the Bible and just do whatever we want. That is not the case. I have spent my adult life holding on to these texts and saying, even if they say I should be silent, I will submit to that. And it is not the answer I've found again and again. We still have time for questions. Are there others? Um, I just want to hear more about how doing all this research has shaped you as a person in this life. It's such a joy. Uh, you can probably see it on myself, right? I, um, I pray this for my students and, and for you all as well, that uh, you, it, for me it has been in that experience when Jesus says, take my yoke upon you for my burden is easy. Uh, like there are very difficult moments. There's moments in which I'm not sure I'm right or I like grab my head, it hurts so hard or I cry in my office because it's confusing. And yet, the Lord is always present. And then there is this abundance in pursuing this call. And this is good news not just for women. <laughs> this is good news for all of us. Because when we all are able to flourish, that's an awesome thing. That's, I think, how God has designed it. Um, the last year uh, has been different uh, because for maybe the first time, I faced some real pushback, and I have learned a lot of what that feels like, and God has shown up in uh, deeper ways than I had yet experienced. Um, so whatever you are called to do, it will not be easy, but it will be worth it. Mm -hmm. And yes. you alluded to a couple of stories that if there are time you could share yes. such a story. Yeah. I wonder if you could do that. Yeah, happy to. So I was speaking about this. For me, maybe you all just have known this your whole life, and I was late to the game. But this idea that Jesus got his body from Mary alone just has totally reoriented. So I, I, I am a priest. Uh, I get to minister the Eucharist. That's a whole thing we can talk about maybe, but uh, when when one does so at the table, you have an such oh, an profound grace that you get to um, ask that God would bless the simple little bread and, and the wine. And as I have thought about this in my tradition, we believe there's a profound mystery of grace going on there. And so that that bread becomes just a simple thing to a way that God meets us. It becomes the body of Christ. I know there are maybe some of you studied all the debates about that and there, but somehow he's present in a tangible. This is what I love about our faith. Our faith is not just how we think about our heads or floating in clouds someday. It's like this weird stuff that we put water on our bodies and we eat little bread and little want. Like, that is so weird. And actually, people thought it was weird in the first century, too. They thought that Christians were cannibals. Maybe you've heard of this because they were eating body and blood. I'm seeing some knots. It, like, re recall for yourself how weird our faith is, right? It's so tangible. But as I thought about this body, Jesus's body, and Jesus said, Mary's body is going to be a part of this body, right? There, I'm, I'm invited here too. Uh, and then I think as the priest cleans up, like there's, a, we respect that act. And so if there are crumbs, we want to preserve them. And you fold the, during the season of Advent, I always then reflect on Mary swaddled Jesus, <laughs> 
like clothed this body. And, and, and now I have the profound grace in this mystery to do this. Now that is all, nobody needs, I mean, now I've said it publicly a few times, so I guess maybe people at my church know. Um, but like all of that work is going on. Uh, as I'm, and I, I often think there's been so many times and places where women are not allowed to step on this side of the table. Like there's people who think I don't belong here. Uh, and Jesus says, nope, you're going to be welcome at my table. And that's not just a feeling thing, right? That's 20 years of exegesis by which I stand confident in that. Mm-hmm. So that's one example. Yeah. Yes? I've been thinking lately about, like, things that are outside of the binary, like in Genesis. Oh, thank you. Absolutely. There yes. was, like, night and day. Yes, but Right. But there's Everything dust. between yeah. solar noon mm-hmm. and like the negative mm-hmm. solar moon noon is still also yeah. part of creation. Yes. And we don't really talk about that, even though it's like the design of the poetry. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, so how does that fit in with yes. gender for yes. people that are both or neither? Mm-hmm. Thank you so much for naming that. Uh, and that's maybe I wasn't stating it explicitly, but this is what I meant about I see my work as preamble. Uh, There's a book that I recommend to you that's coming out this year, highly recommend. It's called Gender as Love by Felipe de Valle, who is a professor at TEDS. And he too says, this work is upstream of the conversations. So I am fully aware, and that's why I think Mark Yarhouse is coming or Megan DeFranza. They are expert uh, in, in helping. So what I'm seeking to say here is first and foremost, I believe that Christians should navigate at, with compassion, right? This is a little bit of what I was talking about, gender stereotypes. It's even more pressing for those with gender dysphoria uh, who are navigating these waters. So compassion, that's what I so appreciate about my colleague Mark Yarhouse's work. Um, he's so compassionate. He listens. This is, has been his work for 30 years. I wonder um, if... What I'm saying about all humans being in the image of the non-embodied, non-gendered God is an affirmation of inclusion. And yet, and here's where I'm a little bit more trepidatious, uh, and you all might be able to say, hmm, you need to think about that differently. But especially reading some British uh, uh, gender uh, uh, theory recently, there's also a danger of no definitions at all. And and again, I was most convinced by this, how are you going to argue for gender justice if there's no definition? I was like, oh, wow, I really want to think more about that. So is there a way in which um, we can, I, as a scripture scholar, want to say, God said male and female are good. I think so much of ancient Near Eastern and Greco-Roman society Right, you know this from Aristotle, the male is the idea, and if something goes wrong in your mom's womb, you end up a female, (laughs) right? If you didn't know that, it's true. Um, so, So I think so much of that affirmation is to say, hey, the half of humanity is also equally valued, and now we are blessed to live in a time in which we need to think more deeply and be more compassionate toward those who don't fit. But I, I don't think I'm at the place. I don't think this is what you're... I wouldn't want to then say there is no ends of the spectrum at all. But to listen well at, um, how we can proceed with rootedness in our faith and then compassion and learning. That is an insufficient answer. Um, but I think, I, I do believe that if we hold on to the tethers of the good news of what we're given, then that provides more sure footing to move forward with listening and compassion and definition of some sort. Y'all's generation will take this on. Not like I'm like dead or something, but um, I mean, that's something about getting a little bit older is, is again, like I said with this book, I'm going to do everything and make everybody happy about all family and all gender. Human finitude. Like you have to pick your lane and, and stay in it for a bit. All right, we have time for one more question. Um, you've talked a lot about like how God the Father and God the Spirit are kind of disembodied and sort of like beyond gender. Mm-hmm. How do you feel about like 
be gendering the terms that we use to talk about life exactly. as a father. Exactly. Or even just the right. life that he from that one exactly. of them to God. Right. So if if it if you would have a chance to read particularly the fourth chapter of this book, that's where I kind of wheel, walk through that path. I believe that when scripture gives us the language of fatherhood for God, that, and not just I believe, like this is like the Christian tradition. Why are we in relationship? Why are we able to call God as father? Because we're in relationship with Jesus. Jesus is the son of God and we are incorporated into that. There's a specificity of that fatherhood. Given that then, when we say father, we aren't kind of imagining what fathers are like and like, oh yeah, God's a better version of that. We really have to work top down, revelation, down to say, how has God defined fatherhood? Uh, His identity as father, it is in this non-male, non-sexualized revelation in incarnation which is fitting for the relationship that existed eternally. As as the creed says, God from God, light from might, true God from true God, unbegotten and begotten. Um, and yet we are given the revelation of those terms at the incarnation. So I have a little quip somewhere in the book of when, I, when we say God is Father, we're actually making space for the fact that God chose for the Son to have a mother. <laughs> This is why I I have not been persuaded to move in the direction of calling God mother. I I respect, I know there are maternal imagery, that's fine. But for me, like pressing into the revelation of the incarnation, Mm. there's a power there. Because then I get to invoke all of what God has done with Mary. Uh, Now, I can carry that package into male pronouns um, or seek to not use them you know, we don't have to use them. You can say God's self and it won't kill you. Um, but also to be careful about not losing the personalness of God. Uh, I, I had just completed a Hebrews commentary this week. And even in that, like every time I came to a masculine pronoun for God, I had a fight with myself. Should I use it here? Should I not? How should it? So all that to say, I find pronoun use one of the most difficult. I'm excellent with father. I know exactly what I mean by that. Pronouns are tougher. That's more work I need to be doing. Thank you, Amy, for a wonderful talk.